a lot of companies that have um, come out over the years, like with this type of product. Mm -hmm. But I'm the inventor of like period swimwear. People have copied it, but mm -hmm. we're the best. Like they don't even understand like really like what goes into it. I hear some companies that will say like their products are waterproof. Like ours aren't waterproof. Like who would want a waterproof? Like a waterproof is an umbrella. If something goes on it, it doesn't absorb. It just rolls off. Today's guest is the founder and CEO of femtech company, Ruby Love. Crystal Etienne's company has generated over $70 million selling menstrual apparel like underwear and leak-proof swimwear. In fact, Crystal holds the patent for leak-proof swimwear. In today's episode, Crystal is sharing all the strategies that have helped her have such rapid growth in this industry that has become very competitive. So if you're interested in hearing Crystal's story and learning some of her strategies. This is going to be a great episode for you. If you're new around here, hi, my name is Sewa Ajay Pele, and I host the She's Off Script podcast, where we help you create your own unique blueprint for business success. Before we dive into this episode, I want to ask you for a favor. Don't forget to subscribe and share this episode with someone else who can use it. All right, with that, let's go ahead and dive straight in. Crystal Etienne, welcome to She's Off Script. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me. So for anyone who hasn't come across you or Ruby Love before, could you share who you are and what you do? So I am Crystal Etienne, as you said, and I'm the CEO and I'm the founder of Ruby Love, which was formerly a panty prop, but rebranded in 2019. And then I am also the co-founder with my husband, Jean Etienne, for um, CAGE, which actually just stands for our name, Crystal and Jean at the end, but it also is an angel investment firm that invests in Black women businesses. I love to hear that. But how did you first and foremost get into the space you're in now, into the, the menstrual apparel space? Yes, that was just out of my pure frustration. Mm -hmm. um, actually, both was out of my pure frustration. But the menstrual space was... Uh, any woman knows of dealing with your menstrual cycle, me, since I was 11 years old, every month when it comes for us, it's just like, oh God, like what is going on? You dread it. And then I just felt that there was a better way to like, um, I would say like deal with your period mm. and your menstruation. Whereas instead of being uncomfortable, we can be comfortable and we can do the things that we like to do. Regular basic things like swimming, going to school, sitting, you know, just basic normal things that people that don't deal with a period also deal with, that we can go about that our day, which is being comfortable. Mm. And I think I read that you spent $25,000 developing <laughs> your dry tech. Could you share what that development process looked like? Yes, I didn't know it was $25,000 when I was doing <laughs> when I added it up, it, it came up to that. So mm. to start, when I first came up with the idea, I live in New York. So it was, to me, it was like, let me get on the train and go to the city, to the garment district. And I got a bunch of samples done, which cost money. Um, mm. Each one was different. It, everything was, some were about $200. Some were up to, I think I, it was so long ago. I think maybe like the most I paid for one was maybe like $1,100, $1,200. So I did a couple of samples um, on the product, like to get it, um, to figure out which manufacturer I was going to go with. So I chose one. And then the next step after that is finding fabric. I had to buy and pay for the fabric, um, getting a website up to date. Things cost money. Mm. Um, cut and sew, like going into production, all of those things. And then once I added it up, it added up to $25,000 of my own money. <laughs> Oh, wow. Now, also just in doing research for, on you, I learned that you quit your day job before you even made a dollar selling. But within months, you had made like a million dollars. So how did you make that jump? How did you have the faith to make that leap, number one? And how did you grow so quickly? This is oh. like net revenue, a million dollars within months of launching. Yeah, so... That part, I didn't think of at the time, but I was like insane because I was making a six figure salary, like over $200,000, like in my career. And it's just, I just went all in. I've always been like an entrepreneur. So I think that's probably why I didn't think of it. It is crazy. So I, I was born an entrepreneur and like a, you know, a creative, 
So I just went all in with the idea because I just knew that it was something that needed to be corrected, like globally across, like everyone has their period, like yeah, 50% of the population, more than 50% of the population deals with their period. And I just went all in. It wasn't, I don't even know my thought process that day. I know my husband's thought process was it wasn't good, but my thought process was like, I'm going to start um, a business. I had I had a business years and years before that, but mm-hmm. they were like brick and mortar stores. But this one, I said, I'm going to go all in on e-commerce and I'm going to grow it globally um, to get to the million dollars of your second part of your question, mm-hmm. like to get to over a million dollars. I never really reached a million. I think I went to like $1.1 million. That was just learning my audience. And that was over a couple of months of just speaking to people, putting on all the hats in the company and figuring out like who my customer base was. Mm. How did you do that? Figure speaking out who to your my customer customers. Was. Yeah. Yes. A lot of people ask me that. Like, what do you mean by speaking to your customers? Mm. <laughs> when you first start a company, a lot of people, especially these days, not in 2016, but these days, a lot of people want to hire this big team. They want, But you don't have the money for that. You don't have the means. Yeah. Even if you do have the money, you need to learn and know your business like, like the back of your hand. So mm. speaking to your customer, when I speak, when someone asks me that question, I always explain to them, like, you can speak to your customers on a daily basis basis, whether it is on social, whether it is a chat on your website of them asking about your product or your service, you're speaking to your customer. And then after you're speaking to them all the time, you will start to see that there's a trend of what they're asking. And then you can start to create that person in your head because they, it's pretty much of the, of what you're offering. There is someone out there for it and they all have the same issue, the same likeness. And that is how I found my customer. Hmm. Now, as you've said, you were successful. You had honed in on who your ideal customer was. Why did you decide to change your name? Why the rebrand? It sounds like you did it reluctantly, but you still did it. Yeah. So I wasn't going to do it at first, but our company name was Panty Prop. To be a global company, I had learned even from 2017, I realized that the word panty is is considered like derogatory in some countries. So we had... It was very hard to do because Candy Prop never had a problem with the name. No one ever, ever questioned it. Like looking back at it now, it's like really weird that no one, no one cared that there was a box, you know, out there, Candy Prop coming to you. <laughs> but no one ever did. They, uh, people used to actually think it was like porn. Like if I say it to someone Ooh, like on the really? street or if someone asked me like what the company name was, um, but never had a problem with customers or anything like don't, you know, give this to my, send this to my house and Never. So to rebrand it was hard because I had built up organically so much stuff around Mm. panty prop. So that was where the reluctance came from was that, are we going to lose, you know, what I built up like organically all these years, all of our SEO, everything. Mm. But in 2019, I had to make a decision that I want this to be global and I cannot be global with the name panty prop. And that is the only reason why the name was changed to Ruby Love. Man, that's four years in. And as you said, you had built up so much around that. It takes courage, but it also takes the foresight to know that if I do this, it's going to help me catapult into the next level of my company. Yes, and it did. It worked out great because Ruby Love obviously is a much better name and much yes, prettier. Yeah. Any problem. <laughs> Now, you found your initial success with the moms of teenagers, right? Um, And most of us growing up, we are used to pads and tampons and things of that nature. I wonder, were the moms of the teens at all reluctant to use Ruby Love products? Oh, never. No? Okay. Absolutely not. They come in, the mom Mm -hmm. comes in to buy for her daughter, but they also deal with their you know, period. They come in for love. We used to call it, um, that's why the name love is there. Cause it Mm -hmm. actually is like a love product. Like you love your daughter and you do not want her to be stressed out how you have been since you were 10, 11 or 12 years old. Mm -hmm. So you find something that is going to try to make her life easier. But as you're buying it, you realize you love yourself too. And like now I'm 30 something years old, 40 something years old with Mm -hmm. a young preteen, and I'm tired of dealing with it also. So they purchased for themselves also. 
Mm, that's good. Cause I always wondered if converting them would be difficult since they're not used to they're, or they're not sure. Does this dry tech actually work? Right. Oh, with that thinking, they wouldn't, you wouldn't give it to your daughter. So a mom that has a daughter, that's you would true. never give her something that mm-hmm. you wouldn't use yourself. That is so true. Absolutely. I do the research up and down before I would give anything to my kid. Um, I love that. Now, in following through with your story, I know you went from being just in your basement to now having a fulfillment center with over 40 employees. So I imagine there were some pain points as you were going through the growth process. Could you share what those pain points were and perhaps maybe some advice for business owners who are going through that growth right now? Yeah. So getting to a hundred thousand dollars is one thing. Yeah. You're like, like I said, you wear all the hats, everything getting Mm -hmm. to a million dollars is another one. Now you maybe have, you know, two employees, but then when you get to $10 million and over $10 million, like I have grown a $70 million company, there is a lot that comes with that that you cannot do when you were running just a hundred thousand dollar company or a million dollar company. So the, I don't want to call it pains because like you're growing. So everything comes with its failures. Um, There's been plenty of things that we have tried that has failed, Um, Mm -hmm. but I don't look at it as failure. I look at it as just, it just, it just wasn't for us. And I would say like the most biggest, pain that I could think of. I don't even call it a pain because I don't think of anything as a pain. I just, I'm like, just let's just solve it and move on. I would say it's probably putting so many people together that don't appreciate opportunities that you give them. Cause I'm Mm -hmm. a very, very laid back um, person, a, a very laid back CEO. I've always have been. I'm very laid back when it comes to if I hire you for a job, you know, it's your job. Like I'm not on top of you. I don't, mm-hmm. I don't micromanage, but yeah. I expect you to execute. And when I ask you three months from now to, you know, where's the execution? Yeah. Like you can't be mad because I'm asking you, where's the execution? Right. So um, that would be like the, the most biggest thing. Um, I don't really mesh very well with people who need to be um, like micromanaged, I should say. Yeah. I mm-hmm. like I like people who are bosses like that. Mm-hmm. I'm going to get this done and this is what I'm set out to do. Mm. So it sounds like finding the right people of that maybe initial 40 people you hired was a challenge. What else did you have to navigate in order to kind of come out from that growth spurt successfully? It's just realizing like how to manage people. And I've always managed people my entire life, like for like over like 20 something years. Mm. Um, but it's different when it's your company, when you're managing people, because there's certain mm. things that you cannot say that you want to say. Mm. Um, and there's certain things that you cannot do. So that, that would be the most difficult as when you want to really tell someone certain things, but you have to do it through a third party. Mm, that's and then sometimes true, a third party, sometimes a third party doesn't even relay it. Like they have to smooth it over because that's their job. Mm-hmm. When in reality, it's the truth. And I, I guess that, that that would be, I would say, the the biggest with dealing with a bunch of people and coming out of that, mm-hmm. learning how to say no to certain things and to certain people and learning how to move on. That's the biggest that I think a lot of people when it comes to employees don't know how to do. And I've learned that very well. When someone who works for you tells you like they are not happy without them even saying it, you can see it right away and you can't Mm. ignore it at all. And it Mm. it doesn't mean that they're not good or they're not right. They're just not right for that particular company and that particular environment. Mm. So I know you now, you own your own fulfillment center. Are you still in the same fulfillment center as the first one? Or have you had to upgrade as you've grown as a company? Oh, for years, we have run our own fulfillment center. But last year we went to a 3PL. Mm. Yeah. So okay. now that is like a challenge all in itself, but it's actually a good challenge. It's like something I should have done years ago. We were running our own fulfillment center where everything was going out of our warehouse. We have a um, over a 10,000 square foot warehouse and everything was going out of there, but it's no longer for the last, um, it's not a year yet, probably since like August of last year. It's so at maybe, a 3PL. 
maybe taking a step back and explaining what is a, a 3PL for anyone who's not familiar? Yeah, so a 3PL is where you they're shipping your stuff out for you. So they are a third-party logistics where they log into your system, get all of your orders as they come through, and they fulfill them every single day. And then you basically are managing the 3PL at that point. Mm, when there's so issues, when there's mistakes, yes. Like I know fulfillment like the back of my hand because I didn't even realize I was in the fulfillment business, but I was. <laughs> mm. shipping our things. And That's it's a true. lot that goes into it that customers, you know, on the other end, just don't understand. Like, you know, it's just, you place the order, it's taken off, it's packaged. They think it's just like, oh, just come to me. But you're relying on other parties like to get that to you when you're running a fulfillment center. So after the order is taken off, it comes in, it's packed. But then now you're handing that off to a carrier that is not your company, that you're basically at their beck and call. They have employees that can Mm -hmm. lose it, that can damage it, that can steal it, that didn't scan it. Um, But the customer does not see all of that. They just see that I gave you my money. Right. And you need to come and put that package, you know, on my porch. (laughs) (laughs) So I wonder in retrospect, would you have started with a 3PL or would you have kind of followed the same process with getting your own warehouse? Oh, yes, I know. So Yes, I would never, ever run a fulfillment center again. Um, But I like that I understand it because now we know with our fulfillment center, like when they're like basically like bullshitting us around, I should say. Mm -hmm, Like we did it for so long. It's like- You can call their bluffs, yeah. Yeah, like that's how it happens. Like we know, Mm -hmm. like just tell us the truth and they know that. So they wind up just telling us the truth and it's just like, let's move on. Right. Exactly. Now, I'm also curious, maybe one more question on this point. When you look at the overhead that's required running your fulfillment center versus moving to a 3PL, do you come out on the plus side profit wise or is it about the same? It's pretty much the same because when you're Mm -hmm. running a 3PL, you're still paying for storage. Um, You're paying for pick and pack fees. Whereas with a fulfillment center, like of your own, Mm -hmm. you're you're doing it, you're paying labor mm-hmm. um, for the people who work there. Um, you're paying for mistakes. So you're not getting any credit back for any of your mistakes. Um, and then you're also has nothing to do with monetary. You're dealing with um, the value of people when you're running your own fulfillment center. Um, if you're dealing with a 3PL, they're outside of outsourced vendor. So you don't have to deal with any of that. They basically have to answer to you. Mm, mm, Got it. All right. So moving on then, um, I know when you first started, there weren't a lot of people in this space, but since over the last few years, I would say there's a wider acceptance of products in the menstrual apparel space. How are you staying ahead of the pack? How are you staying fresh and innovative so that, you know, you continue to stand above and beyond your competitors? Well, just being the best. We always were the best from day one with no money or none. Right. Like our product is much better. Um, Mm -hmm. There's a lot of companies that have um, come out over the years, like with this type of product. Mm -hmm. But I'm the inventor of like period swimwear. People have copied it, but Mm -hmm. we're the best. Like they don't even understand like really like what goes into it. I hear some companies that will say like their products are waterproof. Like ours aren't waterproof. Like who would want a waterproof? Like waterproof is an umbrella. If something goes on it, it doesn't absorb. It just rolls off. Mm -hmm. I think it's pretty disgusting. People don't pay attention. Like ours is not waterproof. It's actually water resistant. (laughs) In that way, there's a big, huge difference. Mm -hmm. Um, And people just not have not managed because I'm the inventor of it. Like to really like figure out, and I would never tell like my secret of what that is, never figured it out. So staying above, you know, and ahead of that is just always just being the best. Like we've never had more money than any of the companies, but we managed to be number two, you know, in the category. There are things that I see now, like with some of the companies, they'll say that you can it hold 12 tampons. I actually made a joke about this like a few years ago. Um, like when some of the companies, like my competitors, were saying, like, oh, if they went up to five, then they went up to seven. It's like, and now it's up to 12. I'm, I'm telling you, I've seen a company, like a few companies Why recently. Why would I want it to hold that much? 12 tampons. Why? 
because it's better for their marketing and people, you know, see that and they're like, that's great. Um, It sounds like a bacteria. (laughs) A problem waiting to happen. No. (laughs) Yes. Um, Like I said, we stay above that and we have always managed our, you know, position in the category because we've always just, we always just were real with it. We, we were never, we really were never a competitor. They met as a competitor. Like our product, even if you look at our gusset, it's completely different and it's made like that for a reason. Um, whereas, you know, you can still, we don't tell you like to lose all of your pads. If you don't want to use a pad or a tampon with our product, you can, you know, cause we don't know your flow. You don't, you don't have to, or you can. We don't tell you what to do with your period cause your period is completely different at all stages. Mm-hmm. None of us can sit here and say that our period is the same every single month, like since we've had it. We just can't. One minute mm-hmm. it's light, one minute it's, you know, heavy. And you just don't know when that gush will come. And you just mm-hmm. don't know when you might put on a tampon and it might be nothing on it. We right. just don't know. Our, our Like our bodies are not speaking to us to tell us that. So we just always just lived in our space, like to say, like, handle your period you know, and your menstruation, how you want, but here is something to make it more comfortable. Here is something to make it more doable. And we've never tried to be a competitor in the space. Mm -hmm. We're just, we're just good at what we do. I love that. I'm also curious. I see wording on your side about patent, patent pending. How do you legally protect your position? Oh, I'm actually, that should be taken off because we actually, the patent has been issued probably like, yeah, patent was issued. Congratulations. Completely. Absolutely. So to protect it, because there's so many people that's out there, no one has outgusted or anything. And honestly, it's like it's not an issue. (laughs) No, not an issue. Good. I know in the tech space, there's people consistently, you know, filing lawsuits against other people who are infringing on their patents. But given that people have not been able to replicate exactly what you have, I'm glad it's just a non-issue. Yes, absolutely. Like, I'm not really, I'm not worried about it. Nice. Now you have raised capital and given that you were doing so well before, why the need to raise capital? So that, it, when I did that in 2019, that was where I saw like, okay, I can, I never had raised funds before that. We had no debt, no nothing at all. Mm. And I think at that point we were probably, we were a little over $10 million in sales at that point. So again, people ask me that all the time. Like, why did you raise the funds? It's because so we could have moved faster at what we were doing and become global at what we were doing and were able to fix things that you can't do when you don't really have the funds when you're running a multi-million dollar company. Mm. So I'm also curious, some of your competitors are owned by by conglomerates today. Uh, Given that you have investors, do you feel any pressure to sell so that they can realize their their gains? No. And that just happened like probably both of them, the two that you're referring to just happened in the last year. Um, And they were companies that were there a few years way before Ruby Love even existed. Mm -hmm. Um, Some of those companies before they even sold, they were trying to figure out like how you know, this black girl is still around running Ruby Love. (laughs) And like I said, it's just because we're just good at what Mm -hmm. we do, but we weren't ready. Like it's just, we just weren't ready at the time because like I said, we, there was things that we had to do, like moving to a 3PL, um, doing things like when you don't really have like a lot of funds to do that, even with doing the deals, like people don't understand when you're in the tech world, like even the deal that I made like that of re-raising the funds Mm. it's not what you think it is like it's not so much that you you have to just keep raising funds in order to keep going so Mm. we've never really had like a lot of money and someone will look at the deal and be like oh you raised you know you did a 15 million dollar deal that's not a lot but the 15 million dollar deals i've never raised anything since you know 2019 Mm. And we just keep growing and growing. Um, Last year was probably like our worst year, but I think that was for everybody, just the economy, just in general. Mm -hmm. But we've always just kept going. And people that usually say that are people who never really ran a multi-million dollar company. So all I say to that is like, when you get there, you'll understand. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Well, I'm glad that year over year, you're still growing, which is amazing to see. So what's next for Ruby Love? I know you've, you've started your own, um, 
what did you call it? Your own venture capital fund for Absolutely. black women. So what else are you working on? Yeah. So for Ruby Love, Ruby Love is going to be, we're not just a period underwear company or a period swimwear. We actually are a leak proof company and we're going into um, different things of innovation, like in, um, I can name like one category home. That's one big one. Um, so I can't really speak too much about a lot of the stuff, but we're mm-hmm. think of just like your Procter and Gamble, like in that way of what they're known for, you know, mm-hmm. in that way. We're like we're not like the other companies that you name, like where we are just period underwear company, where you just go get your period underwear and then you're just fine. We're not that. We you're are the a leak full leak proof company. company. Ooh, I like and it. It's a completely different than just being a period underwear company. Mm-hmm. And as far as Cage goes, that mm-hmm. is something that is very near and dear to me and my husband. Um, it is supporting Black women that just really honestly don't have that friends and family round. It's actually before that. So we call it soil. We coined the term soil funding, like their mm-hmm. seed, pre-seed, like all of these like unnecessary names, but we coined another one, which is soil, mm-hmm. which comes before pre-seed. And these are all women that I just... It was started because I don't want Black women to make any of the mistakes that I made before. And if I can help you to like avoid that, spending money on things that are unnecessary, doing things that are unnecessary, Mm. and spending time on things that are unnecessary. If I can help you avoid that in the beginning, you will be so much better off halfway through. Mm. I love that. And I'm sure it's going to help a multitude of people, including a lot of the women in our audience today. So Crystal, if anyone in our audience wants to follow our, follow your journey and see what else you're going to be working on, could you share where we can find you? Yes. For our um, Black women investment, that would be cageandco.com, which is like I said, me and my husband's name, C-H-J, C-A-J-E mm-hmm. and co.com. And then Ruby Love is R-U-B-Y-L-O-V-E.com. And you're everywhere on social media. I follow you guys there. (laughs) Yes, my personal social media is I am Crystal Etienne. If you enjoyed my conversation with Crystal, I want you to know we have over 180 similar episodes in audio format on she'soffscript.com or on Apple Podcasts or anywhere else audio podcasts are available. So if you love this episode, you will love our other episodes. On your way out, don't forget to subscribe and share this episode with someone else who can use it. With that, we'll see you right back here next Thursday for another episode. Bye.